Right, and we are live. 223 people in the room so far. So um, I'm sure there'll be a few uh, stragglers that join us. Uh, welcome to Understanding Genetics webinar. Thank you all for joining us uh, this evening. Uh, wherever you're from in the world, I know there's people from all over Africa. Uh, there are some people from Europe. So um, we're super proud to have uh, an amazing panel of people who are going to discuss uh, understanding genetics. This webinar is brought to you by uh, Chiba Cannabis Academy and Marijuana SA. It will be hosted by Dean. Uh, we'll be giving away loads of prizes as we go through. Uh, and also, um, we'll give you a special discount on a course. Uh, just also want to highlight the fact that uh, for those of you in South Africa, that recently some of you may have seen that there's a new bill that's out. Uh, it still needs to go through uh, uh, further stages, but we don't want to get too too caught up on debating the bill. Um, there is there, there, are, there are pros and cons to it, and there are diff differing opinions. Although, uh, as we were discussing just before this started. Uh, it's actually a really positive step forward that the government have actually put something down in, on paper. And as our, our European colleagues were telling us, you know, we, we, we've taken some, some bigger steps than some of them have. So please put questions in the chat. We'll, we'll take time at the end to ask questions, um, but we're not going to focus too much on the bill. Uh, let's focus on understanding genetics. So thank you very much for joining us. Um, enjoy the session. Uh, Dean, over to you, brother. Cool. Thank you so much, Trenton. Welcome, everyone. Thank you once again for joining us. I've really been looking forward to this event, uh, Understanding Cannabis Genetics. And we know that this is an incredibly uh, a broad uh, subject, so we're going to build it sort of from a base level and try to get some, some great information from the awesome panel that we have here. So I'm just going to open it up to you guys. Uh, do you just all want to say hello and introduce yourselves? Max, would you like to begin? Yeah, for sure. Hey, guys. So my name is Max. I'm the technical manager for Roll Queen Seeds. I'm also their international representative sales. And I've been working for Roll Queen Seeds for more than two years now. I've been traveling all around the world, was in South Africa last year. Uh, great, uh, great countries, great population, great crews over there. And this is where I met the whole crew. Uh, really happy to be here today, trying to answer as much question as possible and give you news, some insight on understanding cannabis genetics. So looking forward to it. Awesome. Thanks, Max. Uh, Gareth? Yeah. My, hi, guys. My name is Gareth. Greetings from a warm and sunny Amsterdam. Uh, I'm a, one of the managing partners in Black Lion Distribution. We are the official distributor for Royal Queen Seed in South Africa. Awesome. Thanks so much, Gareth. And Mahmoud? Hi, guys. My name is Mahmoud. Um, I'm the head of genetics and new territories for Dutch Passion uh, Seed Company. Um, I'm in charge for the uh, for our collection, what goes in, what goes out. Uh, well, new, uh, territories, new emerging markets uh, are appearing all, all the time. So I will be the first one to, uh, to go there, establish contacts and, uh, and, uh, and establish business relationships. Uh, and I'm here today to, um, uh, to share a little, bit, a little bit of knowledge about uh, genetics. So uh, also looking forward to it. Awesome. Thanks so much. And uh, Jordan? How's it, guys? I'm Jordan. I'm the owner of Green Smoke Room. Uh, we're the first and oldest uh, seed bank in South Africa. Uh, we started in 2009 as an online head shop. Uh, 2011, we started selling seeds. 2013, we got a cannabis license in South Africa where we started breeding our own genetics. 2016, we released our own genetics. And today, we're an internationally recognized seed bank. Awesome. Thank you so much, guys. So as you guys can see, we have an awesome range of panelists here with us uh, this evening, and I'm hoping that we can draw as much information out as possible. But just to start, you know, uh, genetics sounds like such a, a complicated term. And like I said, we can go really deep into it. But uh, I just wanted to start out with just explaining some of the, the, the different kinds of words that you'd probably often be hearing, you know, what is an indica? What are, is a sativa? As you can see, they all have different kinds of effects, some that would be better for for others and and then on top of that we have we have hybrids which would obviously be a combination between the between the two and you know uh, understanding these things is definitely an important thing for someone who wants to grow their own cannabis here in in, in south africa or you know whoever who, anyone who wants to grow their own cannabis to make sure that you're choosing the right thing so you know basic understanding of something that sounds over complicated and and just sort of debunking a lot of things is highly important for me so that's why we thought we'd start out with just sort of a, a basic kind of kind of 
slide. And then on top of that, you'd hear other words like uh, photoperiodic or autoflower, uh, regular or feminized. Uh, what are these different things? Photoperiodic are seeds that would change according to light cycle. Autoflowers are, you know, bred in with a specific kind of cannabis called ruderalis that allows for a plant to not have to, you know, uh, to, to grow no matter the light cycle. And regular or feminized regulars are seeds that could be male or female, whereas a feminized go through a specific uh, breeding process to to create a seed that would 90% of the time give you a give you a female and you know there's a there's a big misconception in South Africa everyone's used to sort of uh, has had an experience with bag seed and uh, or, or growing out bag seed and everyone thinks you know seeds are sort of freely available but there's so much work that goes into the creation of a of a strain a selection you know hunting uh, interbreeding you know and I'd like to just uh, start out by uh, you know to, to put it to Mahmoud and, and Jordan um, what kind of can you sort of in the next 10 minutes explain to us uh, you know the work that goes into the creation of a, of a strain and why cannabis seeds are are, are premium you know um, yeah over to you guys would you like to start or shall I take the word uh, go um, I'll start and just explain a little bit about our process you know how, how we started with uh, crossing African and American genetics um, we we start off with pheno uh, hunting or strain hunting, uh, where we in for us we uh, specific, specifically went and looked into African territories and looked for African genetics. Um, once we found the genetics that we found that we uh, that were preferential to what we liked, and we were looking at different things, not only the phenotype, the look of the plant. We were also sending uh, the plant for testing and seeing the actual genome analysis of the plant. Um, once we found stuff that we that we wanted to add to our seed bank or start breeding, um, playing around the genetics, uh, we would send it off to our facility in uh, California, uh, where we have our licensed uh, breeding facility. There, it's uh, we have a few different rooms, so we'll grow out these plants. Uh, we'll in a mother room, and from there we will take clones. Our clones will go into. A uh, second room that then we actually stress. Um, we stress these clones out. That will create the, uh, the female plants to uh, self or hermaphrodite and self pollinate. Um, we then uh, take the pollen off these plants. Uh, once we've taken that pollen, we have another room that we've taken clones of if, from either the same mother or different uh, mothers that we are breeding with, um, and we pollinate that room. Um, we then take those seeds and we grow them out. Uh, we see the stability of them. Uh, generally, we got to uh, we call crossbreed or uh, repollinate these uh, uh, these plants two, three times over uh, to grow out bad genetics. Uh, the mafra gene, which, you know, it's a, a bad gene. The plant that can stay in for three, four generations that you need to grow out. Um, and then you're also looking for good genetics, um, good uh, genetics in the plant. To, Fr uh, frost resi uh, resistant, uh, mold resistant, high yielding, um, and these are traits in plants, but also at least the word genetics. You know, it's uh, it's the genetics in the plant that are causing the plant to have a high yield or mold resistance or uh, the her a hermy trait in this. Um, and then once we've selected the, you know, the, once we've bred it out enough where we're comfortable that we're getting 99% uh, feminized seeds and uh, stable in the sense where the phenotype is looking 100% the same, and the genotype is within a, um, a variant that we are acceptable with, uh, then we'll, we would release the seeds. Um, that's a method we've moved on to, uh, but there are other methods, and I don't know, Mohammed, if you want to talk about the other methods of um, uh, breeding. Well, actually, a lot of people are talking about indicas and sativas and everything, but I guess most of the strains nowadays on the market are actually hybrids. Yeah. Um, the original indica strains they came from the from the India region, Afghanistan, that kind of region. Those were hard, sturdy plants, you know, usually a bit shorter, white leaves, and uh, they were they were, able, they were known to be to be able to cope with colder temperatures better. Um, the sativa uh, strains they were found more in, for example, the the South American rainforests and everything, they have the, 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 the thin leaves, uh, which um, makes for more air to go through and makes them less susceptible for mold and those kind of things as they are growing in high humidity strains. Um, but just like, for example, lettuce, like um, 
those original land strains they were found originally in the places where they were found in in, in, the, in, the, in the rainforest or in the mountains or whatever but they were they were cannabis and they were giving flower but they were yeah there was no work done just like lettuce the lettuce that we know now originally comes from southeast asia it was just like a few leaves with their, with their taste but because of the work being put into it we actually now have a, like a nice crop of lettuce and it tastes nice and fresh and everything and actually the same thing has been done with uh, with cannabis um so collectors such as uh, henk van dale the the owner of dutch passion the founder of dutch passion uh, back in 1987 um, he was a biologist from um, from by, by study uh, university degree, and he with a passion for cannabis. And he liked traveling, and he traveled all around the world. And he collected seeds wherever he went in India, Iran, Afghanistan, but also, for example, in South Africa, where he visited um, late 70s and early 80s. And he started to collecting those original land races, just as bag seeds back in the days when in the Netherlands we had first hash and then later on we imported um, uh, wheat from Africa and from from um, South America and also the bag seeds came with it you know because they were just yeah. regular seeds like uh, Dean already mentioned mimo, uh, male and females so usually the the females got pollinated and created some seeds and they were also exported back to the to the countries um, and he started uh, Hank van Dada just started working with those seeds and then you see some some Plants, they are known to be, I don't know, they can grow fast, Others, other plants can grow um, high yields, other plants they can turn into a color. And by selecting and breeding, you can actually breed in a specific trait or breed out a specific trait. Uh, this goes over several generations, just like Jordan already mentioned. Um, so it's a time-consuming process. That's also why um, it's wise to buy from reputable seed banks because those are uh, companies that actually put in the work and, and time and effort to to come to a, a, a stable product that um, that we know uh, that we know now. Um, so yeah, that's how more or less how the cannabis genetics works. And then of course there's a big difference between genotypes and phenotypes. The genotypes are more about the, the chemical profiles within the plants, and the phenotypes are more uh, also factors that come from 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 outside. You know, uh, the specific location where it's grown and and, and and light and soil and wind and those kind of things and and it's a weed cannabis plant is a weed and it's very adaptable it's a very adaptable plant so if you put a land race in a different condition after a few generations it won't be that land race anymore because it will adapt to the new situation so that's a little bit how i see the genetics uh, nowadays yeah, uh, i'd like to add a bit on it yes please oh yeah right now nowadays like you know, when people approach and say, look, I need a saliva and I need an indica, it's really hard to make people understanding that there is no such a thing, you know, like we were saying before, like tomatoes, lettuce, and even bananas, you know, bananas used to have like massive seeds and not, not that much skin on it. Um, now we're tending to have like a product that are all of what we've got now, it's pretty much hybrids. And people need to understand that, you know, this is the background, this is what happened, but we cannot just get back to the South African land race and growing it in the market because it's been evolved. It's like yes. taking a tomato that is that big and saying, okay, I'm going to start on it. It's like, you know, it's been evolved. It's been taken by the agronomical word and it's been, you know, uh, upgraded and transformed and adapted toward the word. And right now it's spreading like everywhere, even if it was legal or illegal, cannabis seeds and cannabis has been growing so much everywhere around this world and bred where right now we've got a mix of genetics, which is like 100% hybrid. So like, it's really rare. Actually, few banks still have like those original seeds, uh, which is a formidable, um, something that's really important to keep. Um, but mm -hmm. also we have to recognize that the today's work is already there. The cannabis we've known like 30 years ago and the cannabis that's now, um, is very different indeed. And it's been adapted to human. Human has transformed it like every plant in this planet. Um, that's pretty much I've got to say. That's why I'm so happy that we have, a, 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 or Hank actually started the vault with all his seeds that, he, that he's been collecting since the 70s, you know. So uh, actually just the other day I went I went through our fridge and I, I found a, a bag of, uh, of seeds coming from Durban. It said Durban Poison from 1982. I was born in 1982, so those seeds that's were, crazy, man. You know, wow. they, they were created in the same year I was born. So those, the, the, if you think about that, you know that's ridiculous. That's a totally different so, than what we find nowadays. You know. Yeah, that's Max. I'd, I'd also like to add on that. You know, on the land race side, though, I've always 
been, I've always been want to say that on a land race, land races do adapt. I mean, it's like any, any plant. So any plant naturally does adapt in its area and does breed itself. So the, the land race, you can still find them like in Swaziland. Indeed. There are parts of Swaziland that you can see there's a dominant uh, strain that is powering mm -hmm. over them. If you try to grow other uh, genetics in those valleys, they after two, three generations, your, your strain's gone and the uh, Swazi strain's back. And yes, over time, there's been small traits that have been changing and they've been getting better. The plant is definitely, I would say, a lot, a lot better than it was 20 years ago. Um, and But I think that's for any plant that we have that we grow, even in the wild, that it does kind of naturally evolve. Um, what I was referring with is the seeds you find in the market right now. Of course, if you go in some tribes in Africa, you go in Thailand, you go some places in Brazil, you might still find these genetics relatively untouched, right? Because there was not such like, uh, let's say a new hybrid coming around, pollinating it, even, you know, if it's still in the valley, it's still going to evolve because human has an interaction with it. I was more saying about, you know, these new seeds that you find 99% over the internet, right? Which are not specifically land race, which are, you know, pretty much everything that you see is from yeah. now, it's White Widow, brilliant. Northern Lights, or all of the, even the Durban poison itself that is sold right now will not be a Durban poison that was like, 30, 40 years ago, like the one that Smalmud had is in his fridge, you know, it's yeah. going to be different, I'm pretty yeah. sure. But you're 100% right when you say there is still some places where it hasn't been that much touched. And I think it's a great thing to mention it. Cool. So I think we have a, a much better sort of understanding of, of just how much work goes into it. And I'm, 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 I'm glad that everyone's given a different perspective and, and touched on the land races. Now, all of you are sort of set representing a, a different uh, a seed bank that also does breed. So I'd like to put it to each of you to, to say what your uh, favorite strain is from the company and just a little, maybe a little brief uh, story as to why, maybe because of the effort, a story. I'd just like to get to know you guys a little bit better around the seeds that you that you like. Um, I don't know who'd like to start. Uh, Mahmoud? Yeah, I'll, I'll start then. Yeah, I think that I, that's a question I can I can answer quite quickly and that uh, for, for, the, for the last period has been uh, Mokum Tulip. Mokum Tulip is uh, a strain, it's a cross uh, with uh, sherbet and gelato, two beautiful American strains with a very uh, subtle taste, um, still powerful. Um, and the funny thing is, I think, uh, back in the day, in the 80s, there were a few Americans that came to Europe, you know, because of the, or especially the Netherlands, because of the political liberal climate we had, and uh, there were more um, possibilities for, for growers uh, back in the day. Um, but they actually, they brought a few seeds and there was a gene pool here in, in, in Europe that we work with. And uh, of course, also the, the people in California and, 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 and surrounding areas, um, they also started, they kept on working on their genetics, um, but it was a slightly different gene pool and everybody made different crosses. Why? And you also see that in, in, in Europe and in, in the United States, there were totally different pools of terpenes going around, you know? Uh, yeah, when we had the first mm -hmm. few, uh, taste from the from the the, the, the the new stuff in America, we we actually noticed that there were a lot of you know, terpenes that we weren't so familiar with or totally different tastes. Uh, and the same thing happened for them, vice versa. You know? So we got some interesting genetics that they never found, and now we found a few partners that we can collaborate with, and that actually brings all new possibilities to the table. So, uh, Mokum Shulup is actually one of uh, is the result of one of those uh, projects, and uh, I'm, I'm very pleased with uh, how the result came out. Epic, um, uh, Jordan. Um, for me, it's critical Cape cheese. Uh, it's one of the oldest strains we've been uh, that's been in our breeding program. Um, we've also it's like now the one that we're giving us, but I think it's the seventh or eighth generation. Um, and it's more about the story behind it. You know, it's when I when I was eighteen. Um, uh, in Cape Town, you know, every time I went there and I was smoking and looking for bud, whatever I found, it was always this Cape Town cheese. And I always wanted to find out who the grower of this cheese was. And it didn't matter who I got from, it was always the same cheese that I, that I found. Um, it took a while and eventually I found a, a grower who had this exact uh, plant. He gave us a few cuttings and we started bringing it out to see, and see what could work uh, best with it and ended up crossing it with the Black Domina. And they worked really well together. Um, <coughs> yeah, so it's, it's one, of, one of my old town favorites. Definitely. I'm actually glad you brought that up because I very recently grew a, a critical Cape cheese auto outside uh, and uh, yeah, it, uh, 
<laughs> came out super well and a friend of mine. So we've just been smoking some quite recently. Uh, Gareth, oh, do you want to do you have a favorite strain from the uh, uh, black line? Obviously, it does uh, represent uh, Royal Queen here Royal in South Queen Africa. Seed. Yeah, so yeah, sure, uh, what's your favorite uh, Royal Queen seed and uh, why? Yeah, for me, it has to be our Solomatic. Um, it's a CBD strain. It's just really an impressive strain. It's the application with it, and this, especially with CBD being so high uh, or hot in the market at the moment, it's basically has 21% CBD with one below 1% 1 THC. So that that makes it perfect for South African growing and South African applications in the CBD industry. Yeah, hundred percent. I think the CBD strains are with the way that the market is in in South Africa. They they're going to show proof down there. I mean, we we op operate in as a seed bank as well. And for us, it's a very very you know, popular varietal. Um, yes, Jordan. To mention something there, we actually uh, there's a partner uh, or another company we're working with uh, where we do research trials on, and we actually we, we're doing research on the Solomatic CBD. Um, growing it out here to see uh, what the THC and CBD will come out in South Africa growing outdoors. Um, nice. you know, and that, that, that should be done within the next the, the season we grow. So we'll see at the end of the season. Cool. We're looking forward to hearing what happens with that. Yeah. Nice. Yeah. Very interesting. Just, just, just add a little bit on that. Like uh, we, we, of course, have been uh, the recreational market has made us who we are today. Um, but as a professional company, we also turned into the, the medical side of uh, cannabis growing. Uh, and we yeah. noticed actually that we, we also have a high CBD, low THC strain. And we noticed that for the recreational market, um, there are people that like uh, like to, to taste it or to try it. And Indeed. especially people that are suffering from certain illnesses. Um, but we noticed that the high THC strains are still very popular amongst the recreational growers. But uh, for the for the licensed producers, you know, worldwide, we noticed that uh, the high CBD, low THC strains are really, uh, they really took off and they, they really can do great things uh, uh, with those genetics for their, for their patients. Um, so yeah, it's very good that we now also are looking into different cannabinoids. Like CBD has, has, the, has been the okay. first cannabinoid that actually um, did a lot for cannabis in general and also um, took away the stigma a little bit. Like, oh, it's not only drug, it's to do other things as well. And that's also why we uh, already looked into the new cannabinoid. So, uh, we recently uh, introduced a, a high THCV uh, variety, which is high in THCV, uh, which could work as an appetite suppressor, where THC can actually work as an appetite Increase. uh, uh, increaser, uh, and also as a high CBG strain. And uh, the, those those genetics, especially with low THC percentages, also makes it legal in a lot of countries to grow it, as the psychoactive ingredient is not not as high or below yeah. the limit. You know, so great potential for those strains as well. Yeah, very interesting. Thanks, my foot. And uh, finally, Max, uh, what's your favorite uh, strain from? Oh, I've got, I've got to be honest. Like, I've got a couple of it. Um, first, <laughs> first of all, would be the Royal Gorilla. Look, um, I've, I've been smoking the, the real, uh, you know, the real Gorilla glue um, in US and in Canada, and I was surprised. Like, uh, actually, I was amazed with it. Like, I'm like, this is, you know, next level back in the days. And since we released that strain, I think I've grown like more than few thousands of it under my own control and you know i found some phenotype in it that was like mind-blowing literally mind-blowing better than what better to me in my taste because taste obviously can be subject to debate but we found like very very nice phenotype in it um one of those plants was so dark so special so full of resin like we kept it as a mother like just before personal use and i've got to say this is remanence it's Generally, it's a nice strain. It divides in three main phenotypes. One is more, you know, um, tall, a bit thinny, a bit more going through the OG Kosh, I would say. And some other really replicates the, the real, let's say, Gorilla Glue. And, you know, if you have a nice pick, if you have some luck and if you work well, I think you can get yourself some very, very exclusive phenotype in it. Uh, as good as to me, in my point of view, as the Royal Gorilla. And my second would be the Royal Highness. Um, I literally felt in love with the one-to-one -one THC CBD because of this strain. Um, this is most of the, um, let's say the taste of this plant and the way it grew was amazed me. And the consistency of those phenotypes is actually amazing as well. And it's a smoke where, you know, uh, I could smoke it all day. Literally some taste to me, you know, I get, I get you know, Oh, this is too much you know most of the strain does this to me but this royal highness has this like sweet lovely taste in it 
I have trouble to describe it. It's between Grey, between Kush, and it's very specific. And this has conquest my heart. And so far, I keep growing seeds and I kept mothers, but I keep throwing seeds away and being really happy with what I get. So that's pretty much it. And like I want to add as well, CBD strains, I used to be very skeptical about it. Like two years ago, I've been around like for so much. I'm in Europe, I'm in Switzerland, I go around and I never found something that really seduced me um, in my mouth because me, I'm, I'm not about the high. I don't think I get that high anymore, but it's more about the taste. I love it as a good wine, you know? And I found like recently, one and a half year ago, some very specific and great CBD taste. And I was actually amazed to see that the THC was around 1%, 0.5%. And now we're getting actually some very nice, decent taste and spectrum of terpenes uh, in CBD strains and also a texture and a look that is really yeah. now getting, you know, into this recreational market where people actually don't want to get high that much. They just want to smoke something that, you know, tastes great, better than a cigarette, brings them back in a day when they were smoking good weed, but don't want to get smashed. And this is also getting ready in the front scene now on the front line. And I totally agree right now with Royal Queen Seeds, we're tending to get like, you know, like Gareth when mentioning, I used to, you know, not even looking at uh, CBD plants, but I smoked some really nice Solomatic and now I changed my mind about it. So yeah, the, it's evolving. The cannabinoid spectrum and goals of people is evolving and we are happy actually to help people. And I'm very impressed because I'm growing actually some strain from you guys, Dutch passion uh, about your THCV. And I'm actually, I want to say, I, I need to see what's going on. So. I, you know, I, I love, I love, I love different cannabinoids, and everybody reacts differently. And but most of it for me is, is the smell and the terpenes. And something can smell good, and when you smoke it, it's just terrible. But when something smells great and is exactly the same trace that leaves in your palate, this is amazing. This is what I love with it. Like I'm more passionate about this than the rest. No, th thanks, Max. And I just want to say I'm just I'm so happy that we've we that it's the conversation has come to to old cannabinoids and that we're speaking about it tonight because uh, you know the 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 perception for a long side uh, in the illegal market it's been heavy on the THC and now we're seeing a sort of growth to, uh, you know a big surge of the CBD especially here within our local market and there's just so many more cannabinoids that have so many different effects and I'm so excited that they are being explored and that we have been able to to speak about them tonight uh, that sort of closes off our first half of the of the uh the webinar this evening i think we're now going to be going to a prize giving trenton it's that time it's that time that everyone's been waiting for uh thanks guys fascinating information i'm trying to concentrate on the questions and listen so thank goodness we're recording it so i can watch it back uh, so we're going to give away the the five uh, packs of uh, dutch passion seeds uh i'll announce the names and then we will be in touch uh, after the webinar uh jethro anderson you have won some seeds. Uh, Ross McPhail, Huma Glomo, Tando Nomfete, and uh, Tanya Cummins. So they are the winners of the elections. Yeah. <laughs> Cool, we'll get those uh, to you in the post. Uh, just a reminder, I did say on all the invite information that unfortunately you have to be based in South Africa um, to ship the seeds out. So if you're not based in South Africa, we'll talk on email. Maybe there's somebody in South Africa we can send them to you on your behalf. But we will be in touch. Back over to you, Dean. Awesome. Okay, so thanks so much, Trenton, and yeah, congrats, everyone. Uh, I enjoyed the, the little uh, round of applause. <laughs> Uh, so I'm glad we, well, we've spoken a bit about in our first half about um, sort of, you know, the, the work that goes into into the cannabis, into cannabis genetics. And, you know, everyone's spoken about how the recreational market looks for these different flavors and the gelatos and the Girl Scout cookies and all of these different, the wedding cake and all of these different kinds of flavors that everyone sort of wants to get their, their hand on. So there's a, I'm sure there's a big worldwide demand for for these different genetics. So I'd like to sort of touch on with uh, Max and Gareth, you guys, if you guys this conversation sort of the more business behind the, the the genetics you know the importance of uh buying from a reputable dealer and then also for me the sort of a seed legitimacy because like uh there's a lot of work that goes into different kinds of packaging as everyone sees and i'm sure it's a it's a big thing in the market you know so do you guys want to uh, jump in 
Indeed, indeed. Like, yeah. you know, we've been company, main company have been used for a long time to deal only with home growers or let's say underground growers that had like maybe high demands at some point, but would ultimately work with clients. So that was in the beginning, the base, what, what was real the market about. But now we're attending in a an industry that is getting globalized worldwide, you know, uh, it's taking off worldwide and people, you know, there is opportunists everywhere. So people will always try to be there in first and, you know, get money fast, right? Whether you have people that has a long background of history and has been working uh, in the cannabis industry for a while and that actually put some work in it, right? So there is, let's say in this world, it, it's, a, it's a bit of um, a big decision when you want to start cannabis as a professional company. You know, there is all those aspects you have to see, the financials, the projects, all those legislation, the turnover, your people, your equipment. And finally, the question of genetics comes in. Uh, whether you are you have somebody that is appointed to work in the cannabis, which is, you know, not that many people has been working in the cannabis industry worldwide because it's just getting there. Um, whether you actually go around and fetch your own genetics as if you are carrying a project, you know, even if you're the manager of this project, you will have at some point um, yourself facing the point where I am actually looking for seeds, right? I need genetics, whether I need clones, whether I need seeds. Again, the question about clones or seeds, I'm not going to come on it. If this person is going to say, okay, let's do some selection, I, I need seeds, where am I going to go? If you type today on the internet, cannabis seeds well there is almost i think there is sixty thousand um strains available and there is around six thousand seed bank where to pick right that's the question where to pick because the choice over the internet is like am i gonna take the first guy on the internet and says okay he's first on google that must be the best guy right uh, i think there is a bit more than this that you have to look at what is this company professionals been around for a long time what are the review of the people what are the seeds, you know, and get down to the genetic itself. But you need first to fact check everybody and understand who you're going to talk with. Then after you meet the guy, because you want to face somebody, right? Because you're buying something on paper, but in the end, you're human. You want to talk with someone. And if this person cannot convince you, you know, that what he's going to sell you is going to do the job that you need to be done, he understands what you need and gives you an offer to what's your needs, I think you're not in the good direction, right? Um, but again, if you find a company that is strong, that has been around for a long time, that proves himself to sell quality seed, that has a good reputation, and that has someone in there that can speak with you and that makes sense for your project, I think this is one of the one you're gonna pick. Um, you know, having a cheap price on seeds, it's easy, but seeds is your genetics, is the base of everything. You're gonna grow plants out of this genetics. And if you start the foundation of your building wrong, it's going to be really hard to build on top of that. So yes, selecting your supplier is important. Making sure this person are reliable is important. Have they been in the business good? Make sure you know, check check what who those people have been working with. And in the end, ask people around you. Buy some seeds from those guys. Grow them yourself. You can grow some seeds. You can ask someone to grow seeds. You know, there, there is always that. And finding someone that gives you the right seeds, it's important. But, you know, some people might sell you seeds and say, pretend this is Dutch Passion Seeds or Royal Queen Seeds, and they sell you seeds. You're not going to be able to see whatever is going to be, you know. This is why, again, having a, a real distribution uh, chain, having real packaging is also important because sometimes you might buy seeds to someone and they're not even what you're going to buy. So yes, procurement of seeds is something that is critical right now in the world. Providing genetics um, through clones and seeds is becoming uh, a real demand. Right now, it's my everyday job is this, dealing with people around the world, understanding what they need, understanding what we can give to them, and making sure, you know, we are not selling a solution. We are selling a foundation, you know, something that you have to need to work on. Uh, there is a work of selection. Some people want to breed again on it. No problem, you know. It's whatever you want to do, help us to understand your needs, and we're going to help you the best with what we've got, which is seeds. Um, yeah. That's pretty much my point of view today, Gareth, if you want to add something on it. Yeah, I think I think more practically, and what we've picked up and what we've experienced is 
simple things like storage facilities. Guys are buying seeds that have been stored in warehouses or in the boots of their cars. <laughs> and they're not getting good germination and then everybody's trying to figure out why. It's great strains, but how, they, how are they coming into the country? How are they being stored for this duration before they get sold? Those are things that you need to look at before uh, purchasing your seeds. For example, um, Black Lion and Royal Queen has put a, a 40 foot fridge facility that's holding now over 150,000 strains um, or seeds for us in controlled temperatures. And um, things like that are important. Even uh, traceability. You don't want to be buying seeds from somebody in a, in, a, in a parking lot or outside a mall. And then when you go home, you, you plant and you're getting tomatoes. And then who do you go back to? <laughs> so buying from reputable companies may sometimes be more expensive, but you know you're buying the good stuff, right? And then exactly. if there is a problem, you can get advice. You can get perhaps new seeds. Um, yeah, stuff like that. And, and also registered companies, reputable companies that have been in the industry, like Max said, um, there's, there's so many reputable companies, but there's so many companies that no one's heard of. Yeah. And those are the companies that are dangerous to buy from because they just, they just pop up in the internet overnight and then they, they go as soon as, as quick as they came. But in the interim, you've lost thousands of rands or dollars. Indeed. So, Indeed. yeah. Yeah. Um, can I touch on that as well? Yeah. Uh, so also there's what you're saying with the way people buy from like fly by now seed banks, which since our legislation two years ago, we've had, I mean, I saw last time on the cannabis seed bank poll, there were like 80 seed banks on there. Um, and then, you know, it changes all the time. And it also affects the whole in, the industry as a whole. So if a person buys from one seed bank and they don't get their seeds, they kind of look at all the seed banks in South Africa um, as the, uh, as bad shippers and they, you know, something's going to go wrong, so they end up going overseas again. Um, yeah, and that's something that that's something that we have seen. And then just one step forward on you guys touched on you know the the seed banks and uh, license like your recruitable genetics. Um, one step further, if you go into the medicinal market now, you know in South Africa we've got the licensed medicinal market where guys are looking for reg or what they call registered genetics. Uh, we, I mean, we, I get a phone call every day at least from, and, and you guys got a license who's looking for registered genetics in South Africa. Um, to date, I mean, we haven't actually found any suitable registered genetics. I mean, there's two hemp strains, but you can't actually get the seeds and you can't sell them. Or, you know, they can't be the conqueror here genetics properly. Are the only strains that you actually can register because of the low THC profile. Well, well, we've actually successfully uh, brought uh, brought in um, high CBD, but also has a trace of THC um, uh, uh, genetics that have a SATA certificate, certificate of origin, um, and a COA. Um, and with uh, we brought it in from a licensed company overseas, and we shipped it to a licensed company. But they can, uh, a phytosanitary certificate and a certificate of origin. Um, are not uh, making a seed certified. Like we, we can we can provide phytosanitary certificates as well as certificate of origins for any order, so any high THC seed. But in order to be registered, it needs it's to be a country. go through yeah. a certain yeah. process. And the only strains that get through that process are the hemp. The, the low THC strains, as they're not so, usually they are, they are using being used for hemp or fiber. Or I think we've got a few registered in medical in Europe. I think Bedrocan is yeah. one of them. Uh, there is not much and it's really reserved for pharmaceutical world i yes. guess this will come in the spectrum of registered this, th we, will come in next year i guess so, uh, so we've actually we've started with the vol university we've been doing a breeding program to get that registered so we can actually register cannabis shakes in south africa but currently because there is no breeding program here as well as in africa uh, for high thc they, they have been, to our knowledge, what we've done with other licensed seed banks, they have been allowing for us to bring in the seeds with, with these three uh, paper, with the COA, SAS certificate, and seed of origin. Okay, so then in that case, if they need more genetics, let uh, forward them to me, I can help them out. Yeah, <laughs> so, yeah COA, uh, no problem. Uh, on, do you have anything to 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 uh, sort of uh, add to the, the end of that conversation related to sort of the business of, of genetics or... Um, Everyone yeah, I, th cool. I think I think the one one last thing that is important for for growers, uh, especially home growers, especially if they want to um, sell or give away. Uh, I think that's the legal term in South Africa. You can give away to a friend. 
<laughs> you need a constant supply of genetics. And I think that's the problem that most guys have been facing. They've been getting a strain and then, then people are getting used to the strain and then they can't get the exact same strain again. So when you are buying, you should be able to buy from a company that has stock all the time and that can constantly supply your uh, needs. Yeah, you know, to make sure that the quality genetics, which are stabilized, so that you'll be getting those consistent results. Unavailable, unavailable. Yes. Yes. So, uh, uh, just uh, our last question for this evening. Uh, I'm going to put this to you, Jordan. You uh, mentioned earlier that you were the uh, the, the first seed bank within South Africa. Um, so, can you just give me a little bit of a brief overview of how you have seen the market change in the last sort of few years that you've been involved? And I'd also like to just maybe if we can touch on if you have noticed a, a sort of change in taste in different strains throughout the throughout the last uh, last few year, few years within within South Africa. I don't know if that's a yeah. Cool. Over to you. Uh, so I'll start by saying, on uh, you know, since 2009 up until 2016, um, I would say there was a market, but very much underground. Um, you know, it's you, you grow, you didn't know who the growers were. People were still at this point too scared to. Most growers are too scared to put their address on, um, on when they when they order online. You know, they would have to put a PO box. You know, for our first four years, I'd say 80 percent of our customers had PO boxes where we ship stuff to. Um, and then it's you know around 2016 it started slowly changing. Uh, we did see a bit of an increase then, um, where people became. But I mean, I think e-commerce changed in stuff as well as uh, cannabis movements. I mean, especially with the Dhaka couple pushing. Um, there, there was a lot going on that I think you know kind of opened up to people going, opening their eyes to cannabis and going, you know, let's look at it, let's start growing at home and being a bit more open about it. Um, but the you know the big difference yeah. came in in 2018. Uh, it was really only in 2018 when that judgment call came in and, you know, and it, I mean, our newspapers said you can grow at home. You know, the legislation hadn't even been properly changed yet, but our head of newspaper said you can grow at home, you can smoke at home. Um, our sales, I mean, I have to say we went, they went up drastically, but they increased heavily. So it was great for us. Um, I also spoke to quite a number of sea banks around the world. They, they said the same thing, that they saw a huge increase in sales from South Africa. Um, so I think, you know, people were a lot more comfortable with the second that they heard. It was, it was funny enough. Like, it's for me, I always say that like, people just, they follow, I mean, law is a law, but this, this proved that you literally follow a law that overnight guys went, I can't grow to, yeah, I can grow. And I know people who, it wasn't about the law. You spoke to them and it was, no, you, you know, I can't grow at home. It's not right. It's bad for you. And then the law changed. I was like, oh, well, it's actually see, is it bad yeah. for you? Let me see for myself now. Um, Indeed. So we saw a big change there. I mean, we went from basically having grow shops and seed banks before 2018. After 2018, we have cannabis consulting companies. We've got beauty products being launched. We've got energy drinks. We've got seed banks. We've got uh, there's the the we've got clothing, uh, uh, cannabis clothing. There's just so much going on. I mean, our cannabis expo um, that the first one we had, if I I mean, correct me if I'm wrong, but I think we had over 60 sta uh, stands at the first one, over 120 at the second one. Um, th that just showed like how quickly the industry was growing um, in, in this country. Um, and I mean, if I compare this to, I mean, what I saw in America, uh, what we've done in two years, America was taking about seven years to do uh, with their licensing and their regulations. And still to this day, they are changing regulation and changing it overnight. You know, where they don't allow comments from the public, whereas at least South Africa here, you know, they put out a bill. So the, the, the public come and comment on what's going on here. Um, which is great. It gives a lot more time. And, and you know, which is, I think it just shows where we're going. And, um, you know, South Africa, it's, we, we don't only have the recreational side going on now where it's your home use, where you can grow private, you can be using your private, uh, in the privacy of your own home and you can grow at home, but you also have the, SARPRA looking at the medicinal side, handing out medicinal licenses. You've got DEF handing out hemp licenses to look at the industrial side. Um, so I think all aspects are being looked at and, you know, this stuff does take time, but we, I think, you know, if we were crawling last year, we're at least walking now. Yeah, that's great. That's great. Honestly, as an external point of view, I'm not saying that I've seen the world and I know everything in the world, but you guys, for me, in my eyes, it's a good start. 
Um, it feels like, you know, you're in a good dynamics. Everything is not perfect. You know, everything is not like everybody would want. Like, here's license, grow. Small people you want to get in, just jump in. Tribes want to get in, just jump in. Free money, let's grow, let's export everywhere. That you On a utopia, that would happen like that, right? Yeah. But to be honest, comparing to the rest of the world, the way it happens to you guys, the way that, you know, even if, uh, I think it's Safra, right? Even if those people sometimes ask question to the public, like you mentioned, Jordan, like this is amazing. Like in most of countries where you go, it's just like, it's going to be done this way. Some doctors choose, some pharmaceutical people choose, and, you know, the population's left with nothing to grow. You actually started to define what is cannabis, uh, what that people can actually grow home. And this is, wow. I mean, like I'm thinking about moving to South Africa, right? Um, <laughs> sounds like it's going to be a place where things going to happen. Now let's see if everything aligns and if everything is going to happen well for you guys. But finger crossed, like I say, on the worldwide point of view, it's a good start and you're a good dynamic. Yeah. I really also like the, the whole politic system of, of, of um, South Africa when it comes to cannabis, cannabis because they acknowledge the fact that everybody should be able to grow whatever plant yeah. in their own home and use it for their own thing um, in their own privacy. You know, So uh, this is actually the first country that has done so. I mean, in the Netherlands, uh, people can grow up to five plants, but it's, it has been decriminalized. It's not legal. Whenever a neighbor complains and police, they remove it, they yeah. can still take it away. So, and in South Africa, they cannot take away your plants or your or your or your. Weed oh, it's a crime. Away. It becomes a crime if they remove it, it away. Crime is your is one of your rights, you know. So, so I think South Africa is one of the first country countries that actually understands this, and I hope many like a religion, follow, uh, you know. Uh, yeah. I would. I don't know. You, the, you guys also, Max, I mean, you can, and I would both uh, let me know. But I think we would be the first country where C banks not right now because trade bills haven't been passed yet, but essentially goes the right way. South Africa would be the first country where sea banks could advertise germination. You know, whereas everywhere else we've had to say it so as a souvenir. Here you can legally grow at home, so you can start advertising on that point as well. Um, which is I mean nowhere else in the world can you are we able to do that. So I think we are running a little bit out of time. So I'm gonna to have to end on that note. It's great to see that everyone's so positive about South Africa and I'm just uh, yeah I'm so just as Jordan was saying, you know, I've been myself uh, growing for very many years and I've seen since 2018 a rapid rapid change in in the market in south africa and it just shows how much energy is going into this and i really 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 um you know it's refreshing to see that everyone else agrees on this evening so trenton now oh, i think we're going to uh the next section which are some questions from the audience yeah so canna grossum has been uh, forwarding these questions through so we'll try and get through as many as we can in the last 10 minutes um rory pierce has asked he'd love to know how you breed up bad traits uh, out of genetics it's a matter of uh, of selecting, you know. Um, nowadays, you can even use uh, new technologies on it. But back in the days, it was just you, you grow out a bunch of plants and you look for a desired trait that you find, and you go you go further with this plant and you cross it with another plant that has uh, specific traits that you like. You grow out the, the the generation. If you cross this one, the next generation will be called the F1. You know, you grow those out and you find the individuals that are looking the most like the the traits you're after. And then you select those again. You cross them amongst each other, and then you get an F2, and you breed them out again, or you grow them out again. And then every time you select uh, the best ones, and then the the, the group of um, desired plants will increase every time until you find something that you're really happy with. This can be done over five, six, ten, twelve, fifteen generations, and eventually you can even cross it back to the original parents to get back that original trait you were looking for. And then you would have a plant that is never 100%, but most of the time, the biggest part of the population will have the desired traits you're after. And th this is also why cannabis seeds can be expensive because the breeding process takes such a long time. So just uh, on the back of that, there's a question from Jason Rousseau who said a lot of people are breeding at home and, and crossing genetics, but are not necessarily aware of the danger of putting out unstable genetics. Is that, is that true? Well, whenever somebody uh, makes his own cross, you know, they can do whatever they like. Um, but it will be, yeah. but it will, be uh, it will never be a homozygous, you know, it will, there will be a lot of variations. A lot of, a lot, a lot of plants will look like the father, a lot of plants will look like the mother and anything in between. Just like if you have so, brothers and your sisters, they, you're all from the same parents, but you all look different. You have a different personality, etc. you know, so it works the same with plants. 
Yeah, I think uh, Trenton. Yeah, I think this is more, if I'm correct, if I'm understanding correctly, more to do with if people saying that when they're breeding, they're leaving males outdoors um, that are pollinating the air. Maybe pollen's going around to other neighbourhoods, and then you're if you're trying to just grow feminised plants at home, you're getting seeds in your plants. Um, it is actually a question we get asked a lot by email, like saying, you know, we bought feminised seeds from you, but uh, our plants are full of seeds, and we ask them where they're growing. They say no, they're growing outdoors, and they say there's you know there's no males around, but we say you know. Pollen can travel up to five, ten kilometers in the air. Even um, more. Even much yes, more. Even more. Um, so, I've seeded this summer for the first time ever, and I think it's because so many people are growing for the first time. <laughs> yes. So, so like, with that said, I, I would say if you want to be breeding and you want to be growing at home and you are investing money into feminized seeds and, and even growing outdoors, rather than just throw them outdoors, maybe get a little greenhouse um, tunnel around it that can always help. It could, well, it's not going to 100% prevent the pollen, but it can help a lot. Um, and yeah, I mean, I wouldn't really worry. I mean, I would rather have oaks playing around with their genetics at home and playing with their plants, learning about it than saying, don't grow any males at home, you know, and yeah. Um, yeah. So another sort of comment uh, from Ross uh, McPhail, he said, uh, no one's mentioned anything to do with tissue cultures. Mass propagation also changes the way medical growers will take things further. Any comments on that? Yeah, tissue um, culture is definitely the future because, uh, you know, you can grow, you can grow so much more plants uh, on such a s smaller scale, so it's much more effective. It's a clean way of growing. You can export them all around the world, and doesn't take much space in in any parcel. Or it's very easy and clean and sterile to to travel around with. So I think tissue culture is definitely uh, it's part, part of the future. future. Yeah, it's part. Um, of the future. But you need you need legislation to be in place for that because at the moment, for mm -hmm. example, if I if I take the situation in the Netherlands. Uh, our seeds, cannabis seeds, are exempted from our drug law, so they are 100% legal. Growing plants, however, like illegal. I just mentioned, is still illegal, or up to five plants is decriminalized. Anything more is still illegal. So you're you're working with a, a still a underground situation, which is not workable. That's why we can sell and send seeds around the world, but we cannot do the same thing with with clones, plants, or tissue culture. Tissue culture is also an interesting point where you know you want it's basically traveling, making a clone traveling in a pocket that's like this. Um, whether, you know, condition to keep it is easy. Basically what's tissue culture is using one actually cells, reproducing it into an in vitro environment in, that helps production to the plant. And then after you get a real plant, it has a cost, really important cost. It has a transportation and it's a delicate way. As a production mean right now, I've been visiting many facilities haven't met yet any company making me accepting that uh you know making uh, in vitro plants is a better way than making clients for the full production the cost of making um reproducing cells and making in vitro plants is much more expensive than a cost of a clone but again it's part of the future why because you know you can you're going to be able to transport plants that are disease free and this is really important uh, when you're able to make sure you know that this is only the cells with the gel and this is being transported and this is clean there is absolutely nothing else because there is nothing else in this box um, that's pretty much it and there, there is right now something that I've seen that's pretty much what I've been interested in in the past four years um, is somatic engineering is pretty much is starting a seeds from a cell. It's pretty much a clone within within a seed. Um, basically, you use enough mat, um, enough cells materials to reproduce the plants, almost starting a seed like, but within um, let's say a layer, a coating that once it's going to get humid we'll be able to grow so pretty much soon we're going to be able to have like seeds Artificial that are clones seeds. yeah Artificial pretty much uh it or it's already happening for such a thing like cacao seeds i guess uh, or maybe uh coffee i'm not sure um but it's already there i've seen people working in it and i've been involved into a research facility that is going there and this is really interesting but again it has a massive cost it's still part of the future and it's a technology that has been applied to many different other plants and has nothing specific with cannabis. This is just the technology that is there. And one more advantage is you can from a single plant, you can take thousands and million. thousands of plants. Yeah, a leaf can give you a million of it. Indeed. Instead of just maybe 20 per time or whatever. Yeah? Indeed. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, but right. it takes, for example, of an in vitro from one cell to have a plant that can go into production will be two and a half months. Uh, stop me if I'm wrong. Uh, sorry. 
you know, you can take a lot out of a leaf, but it will take you, you know, a lead time. So again, this has to be put into your, you know, what do you want to do with your company of production? Is in vitro play an interesting game for you? Yes or no? Put it into your production channel. Yeah. Cool. Uh, we've got probably time for another two, three questions uh, from Blue D. If someone is breeding with your work, at what point can they call it their own? Can you repeat the end, please? If someone is breeding, I guess using your your yeah. seeds and genetics, at what point can they call it their own? Yeah, our, like our philosophy as has always been: own. as soon as we release the genetics, it's, it's yours. open for the community, so you can do whatever you want with it. There is no such a thing as royalties in cannabis yet, and that's I'm actually happy about it. But, but once we talk about it just before, that's not it's entirely a, true. Yeah, <laughs> indeed. But you know, we don't have markers yet, and nobody can sue you because you use that genetics to sell it to you. So, 95 percent, it's true, um, and that's the beauty of it. But like you were saying with Jordan, as soon as you're gonna register thing, things gonna be submitted to royalties, and that's become you know the end of freedom. I buy it, I breed it, that's mine. Yes, it's yours, man. Like, you know, as soon as you buy that seed, that seed's yours. The gen the work is there. You can breed it and sell again. Nothing can say anything about it. And that's, to me, I found the beauty. Some financial people will tell you, this is a disaster, man. We need to make money out of this work. Long, long time work money. You know, it's like the Coca-Cola formula. Nobody wants to give it away. It has to make money. To me, I think it's nice because it can be, you know, upgraded and be here for the human so, world. Uh for us, I don't, I, I can't, even with registering a genetic, I can't see, you know, we're never ever going to police your home growth. We're selling our seeds in uh, nurseries and online or wherever to then use it. If they can go and buy it, I mean, we, if we're selling regular seeds and they get a male and a female, they can breed that out. We're not going to stop them. Sure. I mean, that's that, that's going to depend on the law. And like currently at home, you know, there's no law against since Africa of growing and breeding out your own genetics. You know, a plant you can easily breed. So, it's just it would be a small scale you know so for me it would never it, i wouldn't worry about it i would be happy that i know those guys are breeding out well, they're gonna if, if they bred out nice genetics they're gonna come back to my seed bank they're gonna buy more seeds from me because they want to continue breeding more um and, that, and that's where you're just getting a return customer and you know, it's like you know like mama and we've said it's it can take a long time to breed out genetics you know, it's not just your one two three years um it can it can take a really long time so if guys are putting in the time and effort to do that, I mean, I, I kind of just want to see their work. That, that's all. We, we, I would be happy if they can send us photos and show us what they're doing. Um, that's the best of it. But, yeah. Cool. Um, last question. Um, I thought quite interesting. Uh, someone says, uh, Ruby Silver says, they read online that Ruderalis grows in cold climates like Russia. So do you think that might be a good choice to grow in winter in South Africa? Sorry. I think, like, I'm going to say something about um, what Mahmoud already said is we are able to take one thing from a plant, let's say it, its aspect, um, its photoperiodic uh, system, its uh, quickness, its resistance to mold and apply it on other plants. So what we've done with Riderellis, uh, the plants itself is not great. I mean, if you go and you take a land race Riderellis, there is no much cannabinoids, the plant doesn't look great, but it's actually, it's non-photoperiodic. That's the best of it. So we actually took this only part of the fact that it's non-photoperiodic and created automatics. The rest of the spectrum is nothing about Riderellis anymore, except that, that fact. Um, so pretty much, you know, it's we've taken something great from the Indica, from the Sativa, we mixed it, but from the Riderellis, we only took, you know, this uh, auto-flowering, you know, mechanism in it. So I don't think when you buy an automatic seeds, you might, you really have a Riderellis. You again, you have a hybrid that's been bred uh, with high potency plants and it's been integrated with the automatic uh, genes, which is from the Riderellis. Please, Mark Mood, if you want to say more. No, I think, I think, I think you hit the nail right on its head. It's exactly like that. And besides that, maybe it's good to know that uh, the automatic gene is a recessive gene. Um, so whenever you, when, whenever you cross an automatic plant with a, a, a normal high, high THE plant, then the first generation will not be out of flowering, but 25% but of this uh, gene pool will have the out of flowering gene in it. You have to find those, cross them together, and then you will find the next uh, generation again. that will have uh, the first out of flowering plants, but even not all of them, also just 25%. And then by increasing them a few generations, crossing them each other and finding out which are the out of flowering genes or the plants, then eventually you can get to a fully um, uh, automatic plant, which is also 
which which carries the same potential or the terpenes or the psychoactive properties that the original parents had so it's also a and, process but it's a it's a very uh, very welcome trait <laughs> guys we're, we're gonna have to wrap it up i'm afraid um i feel like we could go all night but uh, let's quickly <laughs> run the, the prizes that are still outstanding so um we have uh the green smoke room hamper has been won by salim maju so um, that will be coming to you and the uh royal queen seeds uh, hampers are hillary mercia chad simon becky becky komozo mapoto um brenton makati so we will be in touch with all of those details uh well done to everybody who's won everything uh some great questions good, good uh, job guys bye, congratulations bye. Uh, bye. Hold on, hold on. and my mom my mom won a prize Oh, wow. I had nothing to do with that. Yeah. <laughs> Congratulations, brothers, man. Thank you, guys. Actually, uh, that last applause should be for all of you for sharing all your knowledge. We really, really appreciate your time. Uh, this is a fantastic time to be in the cannabis industry, in South Africa especially. This is growing from strength to strength every single uh, week at the moment. So very, very exciting times. Um, to our international guests, thank you so much for your time uh, from all the way over from Europe and for, from our guys on the ground in South Africa. Dean, as always, uh, Marijuana SA, holding it down, uh, super knowledgeable and, uh, you know, really showing some stuff as well. So on behalf of the Chiba Academy, um, we did uh, one thing I forgot to actually put up was this. So if you, if you quickly click on this, we have a Cannabis Fundamentals uh, 101 course. Uh, if you check at the top there, there's a discount code. Um, so you can, uh, that stays up for 24 hours. So if you want to learn about cannabis, you want to learn about the industry, and you want to get the industry, um, you know, the Chiba Cannabis Academy is what we do. Uh, we teach people about this amazing plant and this amazing industry. So without further ado, guys, have an amazing evening. Thank you so much to everybody who's on the call. We'll be back soon with more. Thank Ciao. you very much, guys. guys. Take care. Thank you. Great. Bye. Bye. Bye.